Uh, can everyone hear me? Thumbs up. Cool. All right. Awesome. Uh, so next, we're very lucky to have Tim Steffenfeld uh, from uh, DeepMind. Um, and uh, Tim uh, got our undergraduate degree at Tufts University in math and chemical and biological engineering, otherwise known as biochemical engineering? Actually, no. It's really <laughs> different. <laughs> it was mostly chemical engineering, and they added the adjective biological later because they realized they could get more funding Biology for the department. Is yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, then she uh, went on to get her PhD at Princeton in uh, essentially computational neuroscience, but it's called something funny, right? Com quantitative? I think it's got quantitative yeah. in there somewhere. A long history of funny, funnily named degrees. Um, <laughs> and uh, I had the privilege of overlapping with uh, Tim at Princeton, and uh, we worked together on kind of network dynamic models. But her main research program was on uh, really cool reinforcement learning, navigation sorts of models, cognitive map models that I think you'll hear more about today. Um, and uh, from there, Tim swam across the ocean <laughs> to London, where she's now at DeepMind uh, as a research scientist. Mm. Still, well, I guess we'll hear about what she's doing now. Um, fun facts about Tim, two more. <laughs> are, um, one is that she's a uh, martial arts master, holds black belts in several disciplines. Um, <laughs> and uh, also, um, one of my favorite uh, postdoc memories was one day I was kind of sitting in my office and in came a box of kittens carried by Tim, and so I got to babysit them, which is one of the highlights of my uh, <laughs> And I got to have a meeting with my advisor without kittens, which was also very valuable to yeah. me. <laughs> yeah. cool. Cool. I came out ahead in that deal. Um, cool. Uh, please help me welcome Tim. <laughs> Uh, thank you for that really lovely introduction. Um, yeah, I will talk a lot about cognitive maps. I probably won't uh, talk that much about martial arts, but we'll see how the question period goes. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, I'm a research scientist at DeepMind now. Um, that's overall a machine learning artificial intelligence company, but I'm on the neuroscience group there. Um, so I do about like half neuroscience computational modeling things and half machine learning things. Um, and in, in both of those areas, I'm interested in this same kind of problem, which is how we can represent um, incoming information, incoming data, in a way that lets us reason about it more efficiently. Um, um, so the, the perspective that I'm taking for um, all of this research is this reinforcement learning perspective. Um, so the reinforcement learning problem is this one. Um, given some task, we want to learn a policy that will maximize our expected cumulative future reward. Um, this is also called value. And we're going to learn to do this using trial and error. It's a very general framework. You can apply it to lots of different problems. It's one of the reasons we like it a lot. Um, you can apply it to problems like chess, um, where your state is the configuration of pieces on a chessboard and you want to maximize your probability of winning the game. You can apply it to a task that's more abstract and open-ended, like cooking, where your state might be if you're like cutting vegetables or stirring something, and you might be cutting mushrooms or some other vegetable or meat. Um, and you can apply it to problems like navigation, where your state is characterized by your location in some task, and you want to maximize maybe your expected number of fruit loops that you encounter as you wander around this maze. Uh, you're a rat in this hypothetical. Um, this, uh, so it's general, and that's one thing we like about it. We can apply it to lots of different problems, and it kind of permits some room for autonomy. The agent figures out what to do. We don't tell it what to do, it just tries to maximize its reward. Um, but this can be really hard to do in very complex problems with a lot of states. Um, you might have a lot of states that you want to learn about. Um, you might have a situation where not very many of these states are informative about reward, and you need to figure out really long uh, spatiotemporal timescales for credit assignment. Um, you might have a situation where exploring the environment takes a really, really long time. Um, and the methods that we usually use in RHEL are not particularly sample efficient out of the box. Um, they, uh, they're, they're classically very data inefficient, and it takes a lot of data to train a single agent. And once trained, that agent's often really specialized. It can't take the knowledge it learned and apply it to a new situation. It's just like really, really good at the one task it saw a bajillion samples of data on. 
So one question we're interested in is if the brain, and in particular we'll focus on the hippocampal cognitive map, deploys a representation of task structure um, that organizes space in order to uh, behave more efficiently over it. Um, and I have a little cute example of how this can be helpful. Um, so a, a kind of inefficient straw man caricature of a thing you could do that's actually kind of representative of some of the way that machine learning algorithms work at scale um, is to uh, do really simple model-free updates. So let's say we take this Y maze. Um, the animal starts in the middle position, um, and it can randomly walk between connected states. Um, and eventually, it discovers that there's some reward in the top left corner. Um, and it concludes, I guess that state over there is rewarding. It's very excited. As it explores the environment, it discovers not only is there some value at that state, but there's some value at the state that immediately predicts it. This state uh, is associated with some future value, so it gets updated as well. As the animal explores the environment, it discovers that this value can move further and further back until it eventually makes its way all the way back to the decision point, at which point the animal conclude, I guess I should go to the left. Um, and this feels a little bit silly to us, because if we were in this maze and we saw a fruit loop at the end of this arm, we would say, I should just go left. All of the states on this arm are connected to each other. They have something in common. I'm going to treat them all as the left arm and update the entire value of that. Similarly, if you were in a multi-compartment environment like this and you found reward in some room, you would know, I should just go back to that room. You wouldn't need to learn about every individual location in that room individually. There's a symmetric benefit that you can get for exploration. Um, oftentimes in reinforcement learning, particularly in, in deep learning applications, uh, exploration is synonymous with choosing randomly. Um, so in structured environments, this can lead to like really inefficient coverage strategies. So let's say you start at some position and you follow the strategy of just randomly choosing actions available to you. Um, and you go left and you go right and you go right and you go left and eventually you cover the entire maze and discover that there's some fruit loops in the top right corner and you're very happy, left corner. Um, a more reasonable thing to do would be to break this into arms again and say, I'm going to choose arm one, then I'm going to choose arm two. Or I'm going to choose room one, then I'm going to choose room two, three, four. Um, even if you're still following this policy of just randomly selecting actions, if you're randomly choosing over arms or rooms, you'll explore much faster than you would randomly choosing over states. So to formalize what it would actually look like to conduct reinforcement learning in one of these representation spaces, um, I have a, uh, I'll illustrate here. Um, so let's say we want to learn in a representation space. Um, so we're now going to have um, a, a feature for each uh, thing that we might care about. In this case, we're going to have one feature for arm one, one feature for arm two. And we're going to represent every state in our task in terms of how much they project onto each of these axes. Um, so if a state is all the way down arm one, it's going to be really far to the right of the x-axis. Now when we discover this fruit loop at the end of arm one, we update the entire value of arm one rather than just updating the state that the value was discovered at. Um, and this now means that we know something about all of the states on this arm um, instead of just the one. Similarly, if we want to use our feature space to generate exploratory behaviors, um, we can once again project all of our states into this space. And instead of selecting a state to go to, you select an axis to explore. So you might say, I want to try and traverse arm one as much as possible or arm two as much as possible. Um, you basically try and move yourself to a new corner of this representation space. Um, so the goal for both of these uh, kinds of representation spaces is that you want to cluster states over which you can generalize, states that share information, and you want to separate states that do not. This is like the superseding, very like atomic concept of representation learning, it's generalization. Um, so sometimes it's kind of natural what makes a good representation. Um, maybe in these states uh, we have clusters or arms. Um, in spatial navigation, place cells and grid cells have a lot of really nice properties. Um, for the more conceptual kinds of spaces that Christian Doler was talking about yesterday, um, we often have independent dimensions of variance that we've already sort of pulled out across our life experiences. Um, but one space that uh, provides a particular difficulty is spaces that aren't Euclidean. Um, so Euclidean spaces, um, Euclidean literally means offer pertaining to Euclid. Um, Euclid was that guy, I, I think of him as the guy who did a lot of geometry before like fancy math was invented. So all of the things that you learn in grade school, like uh, the Pythagorean theorem and the angles of a triangle sum to 180 and parallel lines never intersect, that's all like Euclidean geometry. It's the simplest basic, it's Euclidean planar geometry. Um, spaces that are not Euclidean um, are, are, are a little bit fancier um, and they can be made out of more arbitrary relations. So in particular graphs um, consist of nodes that are all connected by edges um, to each other. Um, and manifolds are things that are locally Euclidean. If you zoom in, it maybe looks like a plane, but after you zoom out, you say, oh, that did a bunch of crazy stuff that a plane would never do, like twist in on itself into a weird knot or torus or something. Um, 
So in these spaces, it's a lot harder to figure out exactly how we should represent them in order to capture the properties we want. And we start, have to start applying to principles of what makes a good representation that may be generalized to these domains. Um, so there's been a lot of thought on this. And I'm kind of just going to list them. Um, one idea is to use predictive representations that cluster states that predict similar outcomes. Um, one is to have a low dimensional state space so that you have fewer dimensions to learn about. One idea is to have a hierarchical representation so that you have the option of zooming in or zooming out depending on how uh, fine grained your planning task is. Um, you might want a representation that's transferable so that you can use the same representation in different tasks. Um, you might want axes that are disentangled and composable um, so that you can reason about each dimension independently and then combine them into a final result. Um, topological or relational representations extend nicely to those non-Euclidean geometries that I showed. You might want a categorical representation if you're worried about object identities or face identities. Maybe you want a causal model because you want to learn the latent factors of the world that generate your explanations. Uh, this is sort of like, this is exactly what you're not supposed to do in a talk, is like just list a bunch of things with, with that like are each individual bullets. Um, but I kind of like it because it, it captures the state of the field right now, which is kind of just like a list of different things people are trying out. Um, and they have this superseding common concept of like, this is what people think that you should probably generalize according to in different tasks. Um, but they're all sort of like things people are trying out in different ways. So one thing that we tried out in a different way was to use predictive representations as a model of hippocampus. Um, and um, the specific predictive representation that we used was something called the successor representation. Um, this is something Christian mentioned yesterday, and I, I think Ida will probably talk about a lot more in her talk as well. Um, the, the simplest way, I think, to introduce the successor representation is to show how it fits into the equation for value, which is the thing that RL is mostly concerned with. Um, so reinforcement learning says maximize value. And remember, we defined that as the summed expected future reward. It turns out you can decompose this into a future term and a reward term. So you can express this as the summed expected future state visits, basically how much am I going to visit every state in my environment, and a reward term, which says how much reward am I going to get at each of those states. Um, so where am I going, and how good is it going to be when I get there? This first term depends only on the dynamics, and the second term depends only on the reward. Um, and this is a nice property, because if one term changes and the other does not, you don't need to relearn an entire value function as model-free learning would have you do. You can keep some of this information safe and only change the thing that changed. Um, and this term that depends on dynamics and captures future state occupancy is called the successor representation because you're representing your current state in terms of your successor states, your, your future states that are coming up next. So to illustrate what that would look like in hippocampus, um, first we'll see more of a, like a, a classic cartoon of what uh, place cell representations are, are thought of um, in some sense. Um, you have uh, each neuron shown in purple is firing uh, proportional to some function of the animal's distance from that place cell. Um, in this case, we use a little Gaussian. Um, and each of these cells is parameterized by some location in space that is its preferred location. Um, the successor representation is a different interpretation. Each of these cells is encoding some state in the environment, and it's firing proportional to the expected discounted number of times that state's going to be visited in the future. So in this case, the animal's going to go to the left. So we see that this representation skews a little bit to the left because those, or those states are, are predicted with higher probability. Um, and I included equations if people like them, um, but I, I won't go into each term. So if you associate each of these states in your environment with some reward, you can use the place cell representation to, to express how rewarding is the state I'm currently thinking about, what's associated with the state that I'm currently thinking about. If you have the successor representation, you're instead saying, um, what's the expected future value? You're saying value rather than current reward, um, which can be useful for a lot of stuff. Um, if you move the reward around, you associate a new vector, and you can rapidly recompute value. Um, so it transfers in that sense. Um, so we use this model to simulate some things. Um, I won't talk about them too much because I want to get to new stuff. Um, but we, one thing we showed was that we capture this asymmetric experience-dependent expansion effect, um, which is like, second, yeah. Here, yeah. Uh, where it's the greenest is the highest reward. Yeah. Sorry, I used to use a green fruit loop, and that would have made a little more sense. But um, so then why is it the green? Uh, it's going to the left because the, the animal is going to the left. This is the um, place oh, code, sorry. not the receptive it's field. It's walking this way. Uh, yes, it's walking. Did I get left and right wrong? It's going this way. 
no, no, no. Yeah, so, so what I'm plotting right now is the population vector, which will skew towards the, in the direction the animal's going. But the, the um, yeah, I, um, I, I should have been more clear about that. The receptive fields will skew in the opposite way because it encodes some location. And so it'll skew backwards so that the animal can anticipate when that location is coming up. Um, My mistake was I thought it's going left to right, so I wasn't. Ah, OK. Um, you also had a question? No, it's a, it's a population curve. Uh, OK, yeah. Um, Yeah, I, I probably, uh, maybe I should present these differently. Um, I could space them out differently or something. But um, yeah, basically, the, uh, the, this, this is the thing we had a lot of, uh, spent a lot of time staring at early on. But the place uh, cell receptive fields will skew in the opposite direction. And if you plot the population code, it'll skew forward. Um, cool. So um, expansion. Um, we capture some obstacle-induced effects um, because uh, basically place cells won't cross obstacles. They tend to stay on one side and get uh, deformed by the presence of barriers. Um, we captured some of the spatiotemporal effects that um, Christian Doler found with his teleportation experiments um, and also some temporal clustering effects. Um, and there's also been a lot of new work um, replicating successor representations. Um, replicating is the wrong word, but capturing different behavioral effects and fMRI effects. Um, in different experiments, um, which uh, I think Ida will talk about because she's done a lot of work on this. Um, so I also wanted to just briefly say what else is happening with the successor representation. Um, there's, uh, though the model that we presented here is kind of the, the simplest, most minimal version of the successor representation, but there's a lot of ongoing research on it. Um, and if you're interested, you should check out these citations. There's basically like people neural networkifying it and people making it a transfer more broadly to different related tasks. Um, we're doing some stuff making it probabilistic. Ida has some great stuff on making it multi-scale. Um, worth checking out. Um, so we got predictive. And the next thing we were interested in thinking about was if we can make this representation low dimensional. So we have a smaller state space that we have to worry about. Um, so we decided we would do the simplest thing and do factor analysis on the successor representation matrix. Um, so um, what I showed before was the successor representation vector when the animal's at one state. If we take that vector for every possible state that the animal can occupy, um, then we get this whole matrix, where the y-axis is possible locations, and the x-axis is um, different states that uh, a neuron might prefer to encode. And this gives us a matrix. Um, we can express this in terms of its eigenvectors um, in order to dimensionally reduce it. So if we take the first few eigenvectors with the largest eigenvalues, these will capture as much information as possible about this matrix. Um, if we use these to then try and reconstruct the original matrix, you see we get something that looks pretty similar, um, but they're a lot less precise. They're, they're now smoother and like much more, much more dark on that diagonal rather than being as precise. And this is because we capture the coarse structure, but not as much about the fine structure. Um, if we look at one vector of this matrix, one eigenvector, and plot it back so that each element in the vector is at its corresponding location in space, um, we end up with these nice like Fourier patterns that have some grid-like properties. They have this like uh, multi-field property, and we were like, we should use these and try to simulate grid cells. Um, that wasn't the only thing that went into it. There's also theories about like uh, entorhinal cortex uh, being useful for dimensionality reduction, um, but you know all those things together. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, again, I'll just quickly go through some things that we simulated because they're, they're in the paper. Um, we looked at grid fields in geometric environments, um, in hairpin mazes, and in multi-compartment environments. And basically, some of the effects that this model allows you to capture well is how grid fields deform around boundaries and in irregular geometries. Um, because this is based on the transition structure rather than the structure of space, um, these boundaries will have a strong effect on the grid cells, and you can see them move the fields around. Um, which is pretty cool. Um, and there's been some further work, too, on different constraints and ways you can modify these in order to make them look more or less like grid cells. So, yes? So something that people have asked me, and I have tried different ways of finding emerging evidence like mm -hmm. this, but I'm still not sure. This view of grid fields uh, sort of seems to suggest that place fields come first and grid fields come second. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure if there's like ample evidence that that is the case. There, there actually is a, quite a bit of evidence that that's the case. Yeah, so they place cells show up independently, or not independently, earlier in development. Um, they also, um, if you silence grid cells, place cells stick around. Grid cells go away if you silence place cells. Um, I think that's the, those are the major evidence that people cite in order to uh, say that like place cells drive grid cells. 
Um, there's also, there, there are a lot of effects that grid cells have on place cells. They are really important to the temporal organization of place cells. Um, and you get much mushier fields without, play, without grid cells. So they, they inform each other. Um, but, um, but yeah, place cells drive and grid cells not in common. Do, do you want to add something, Dave? I just want to point out that be careful with the silencing data. OK. Any spatial, the old models of place cells say if there's any spatial information in the input, the place cell will pick it up. So it, you're absolutely right with the development. Place cells come first. That's yeah, pretty solid. Mm -hmm. But they be, care that, be careful with the silencing. Data. OK. But yeah, that's good to know. Yeah, I mean, they probably require something that comes in through entorhinal cortex, because like all things do. Um, but I guess the, the grittiness, maybe not so much. Um, cool. So, so we, um, yeah, we, we were excited. We did dimensionality reduction. We found some things that made sense. Um, dimensionality reduction on its own has a lot of nice properties already. Um, but um, as we looked into these eigenvectors more and tried to understand where they fit into the, the, the broader body of mathematical theory, we realized that we had actually rediscovered something called Laplacian eigenvectors, um, which are like a super old method that show up in, in every different field. Computer science uses them for things. Math uses them for things. Uh, they're really core elements of, of uh, spectral graph theory. Um, and one thing that's really interesting about them is that they show up as a generalization of the Fourier to graphs and other manifolds. Um, so if you want to capture certain spatial features um, and apply them to uh, non-Euclidean geometries, it can be kind of hard to do. Um, for instance, if you want to translate something in the plane, we, we know what that looks like. You, you move it over there. Um, you can scale something up by just making it wider or smaller. But what these things mean in graphs is a little bit harder to specify. Like, what does it mean to translate something in a graph? It's just a bunch of things connected to each other. Um, similarly, if you try and make something bigger or smaller in a graph, like, how do you warp around um, the way things are connected? Um, and it turns out that there's a very natural interpretation by going through these eigenvectors. Um, a lot of spatial concepts have definitions in the Fourier space, and you can transfer those definitions over using these eigenvectors. Um, so that's the thing that we're working on now um, to try and say, try and basically make predictions about what spatial cells should do in, a, in an abstract task that doesn't even really have underlying spatial structure to it. Um, these eigenvectors have also been used um, for, for learning in, in really the way that I introduced early on, where each eigenvector is some dimension of a feature space, um, and you conduct reinforcement learning in the space of these eigenvector features. Um, so uh, whereas before we had arm one and arm two, now we have eigenvector i and eigenvector j, um, and we learn a value function over these eigenvectors. Um, and they're, in this context, they're called proto-value functions. Um, there's also more recent work showing you can use these for exploration, also similar to what I described in that early slide, where you sample an eigen option and then you just explore that axis as much as possible. Um, and part of the reason these are useful is because they capture large scale structure. Um, and one way to illustrate this is to show that the same eigenvectors can support different levels of coarseness just by changing the weights on them. Um, so if we were to take um, a pretty, uh, a very small place field, something that maybe showed up in really dorsal hippocampus, um, we would need a whole bunch of eigenvectors in order to reconstruct it. Um, oh, sorry. Um, if we were to take uh, an increasingly ventral place cell, it should get, have a wider and wider field. And in this case, we would need fewer and fewer eigenvectors to reconstruct it. But we're using the same ones. We're just weighting them differently. If the information is coarser, we only need to use the first few. If the information is finer, then we need to have weights that cover all of them. But the same population can basically be toggled in order to represent different scales. Yeah. Um, this would also, so this would come out of higher gammas. That's actually, that's exactly what it would do. It's basically like if you want to approximate both a successor representation with a small and a large gamma, you can use the same eigenvectors. Um, the benefit to using these is that um, it takes a long time to learn a successor representation with a large discount factor using TD learning. Um, it takes a lot less time to learn this one with a small discount, and you can use the same eigenvectors and just rescale them. So that's kind of nice. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, they have um, some other nice properties too. Um, and so the, the reason I introduced this in this like dorsal and ventral dichotomy is that this maps nicely onto something we know about hippocampus, was, which is that you get this longitudinal gradient of increasing um, hippocampal field sizes. Um, 
Another thing we can do is um, use this space to conduct um, exploration. So the Eigen options was one way to do it, and we have a slightly different way to do it that, um, that, that I'll, well, I'll show you, but it has some nice properties. Um, so let's say um, we want to do uh, exploration the old-fashioned way. We're just going to diffuse through our environment. We're going to randomly pick actions that are available to us. Um, this is what that looks like. Um, you're going to start in some initial state. Um, you're going to see which actions are available to you. Um, and then you're going to randomly sample one and move to a new state as a result. Um, and if you, um, if you follow this procedure for a little while, um, you end up covering your entire environment. Um, it's, uh, and this is what's called diffusion. You can do exactly the same thing using this eigenvector basis instead. Um, so let's say we're going to start in state S with the same neighbors. Um, we're now going to take our representation of state, project it into the eigenvector space. Um, then we're going to um, get the probable next state in this space, project it, oops, sorry, Let's click the wrong way, um, get the probable next state, and then project it back. Can you wait a little on this? Sure. Um, the, the important thing about this slide is we're doing exactly the same thing, but in a more complicated way. Um, there's a good reason for doing that besides how pretty these plots are, um, and I'll show that as soon as uh, Ida gives me the go ahead. <laughs> wait, maybe everyone is faster than Can I go? <laughs> so you're break What's that? Yeah, yeah. I, I basically um, uh, will explain why I'm doing this. Okay. Um, so, okay. <laughs> um, so um, the reason that um, it's useful to do it this way, um, to take your state and project it into this uh, into this eigenvector space, um, and then perform the transformation and before projecting it back and doing the sampling, is that when you're in this space, you can toggle which timescales you care about. Um, so in the same way that you can reweight the eigenvectors to approximate particularly coarse or particularly fine um, levels of resolution, um, if you manipulate this space, you can sometimes take really large jumps instead of uh, small jumps. So, you, yeah, so it's like you, you project S to an S space, but the K is a projection in eigenspace, and your U, what is U of T? Is the eigenvector of the transition matrix? Yes. Um, so um, S is the, the current state, um, and that's uh, uh, basically when it's represented, what's that? Is that the S role of the? Uh, yes. So you could think of um, S as just specifying some index in your state space, some location that you can occupy. Um, and you might represent, in the original space, you might represent that as a bunch of zeros everywhere you're not and a one where you are. Um, in the eigenvector space, um, then you basically, uh, okay, so if you're, for instance, at this location, um, then this eigenvector will have activity zero. This eigenvector will have uh, activity one because you're in the red zone for it. Um, each of these eigenvectors will uh, represent your location based on how that location captures the eigenvector at that location. Um, um, it depends what level of resolution you care about. For this, we're just taking all of them because we sometimes, uh, uh, and we can rescale them accordingly. Um, if you only take a few of the eigenvectors, that's sort of like imposing a filter where you care about the large time scales more than the small time scales. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we can say some of the technical stuff for that and then just for the sake of time. So we okay. Um, yeah, that sounds good. Um, basically, so in the in the lab this afternoon, I have some code where we can go through and visualize these and mess around with them and see uh, what their what their properties are. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I it's hard to go into this particularly quickly, unfortunately. I think the main point that I want to highlight is that there's utility to be to operating in a space where it's easy to change which timescales you care about the most, um, because that lets you sometimes take really large jumps. Um, and um, so if you're if you're using this uh, if, if you're basically manipulating which timescales you care about a lot, you can sometimes change how you're weighting things to prioritize large timescales over small timescales. And that means sometimes you're going to take a jump that just gets you right next to where you are, like you did with diffusion. But every once in a while, you're going to take a big, long hop and go somewhere really far away. Um, and this is called super diffusion, creatively named, and it covers more ground. Um, it's a much more efficient way to explore. Um, so um, 
if you use this procedure for exploration, um, it's, it's useful in the open plane, but where it particularly shines is in these multi-compartment environments um, where diffusion does really poorly. If you're just randomly moving around, you tend to get stuck in one room. Um, but if you're um, occasionally amplifying your really large time scales, then you'll try to take big jumps. And because these are derived from the transition structure, these jumps will be topologically sensitive. You'll move through, boundary, or through doorways, and that's really nice. Um, we also noticed that um, this superdiffusion that we were talking about is actually just called levy walks in foraging experiments. Um, so <laughs> like reinventing the wheel a little bit. Um, but these uh, levy walks are ubiquitously observed across animal foraging. Um, you can see them in albatrosses searching for prey, foraging spider monkeys. Um, humans exhibit them when they're viewing novel patterns. Um, they're, they're very efficient ways of covering a lot of ground where you locally diffuse, but every once in a while you take a big hop so that you don't overexplore um, some particular region that you're currently located in. Um, there's also been some recent work showing that um, hippocampal reactivations um, show this uh, diffusive structure during uh, replay events when the animal's asleep, um, but the animal's actual behavior tends to exhibit something more like levy flights. Um, so whereas replay has this diffusive uh, quality, um, behavior has an actual super diffusive quality. Um, and the authors um, highlight that this probably indicates that these circuits have the ability to uh, generate sequences across different time scales, um, and that uh, sampling from a model can do either diffusion or super diffusion. Um, so the, the, the takeaways that I want to highlight, and we'll explore some of the details of this more in the lab, um, are that temporally organized, um, spatially extended state representations um, can uh, provide a really useful support for efficient exploration and learning. Um, and I think the, the like, tagline for this, this body of research is that if you have a really good representation of something, you can do really simple learning or really simple exploration and still generate really sophisticated behaviors because you've put all this structure into the representation. Um, and I also kind of want to plug this idea that we can use these principles in order to understand neural activity and neural representations and that um, it's a nice lens for that. Um, so for um, some of the next steps, we basically want to fit more data and see how this does, particularly replay data. Um, and um, I've also been working on trying to integrate some of these methods with, with graph nets and other deep learning approaches to try and get them to scale up to weirder domains. Um, and we'll uh, look at some of this more in lab. Um, so I want to acknowledge a lot of my collaborators. Um, they, um, in particular, Dan McNamee has been uh, lead on this um, exploration work. He didn't uh, like any of the pictures of him, so I made one. And <laughs> uh, Matt Botvinnik uh, was my grad advisor and currently my boss. Um, Sam Gershman was a collaborator on a lot of this as well as Tim. Um, cool. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have time for questions, or is it lunchtime? Sure, yeah, so um, let me um, just show the figure. Um, so uh, the way that I um, wanted to illustrate this is, so you start off with uh, certain coefficients um, for your, your transition structure that reweight each of these scales differently. Um, when we move to orange, um, a lot of the large probability, the, the, the very fine time scales go down in their coefficient and the large ones stay the same. Um, so basically, this, uh, the, the probable distribution over where you go next gets a little bit smoothed so that it ends up becoming more heavy-tailed. Um, the, the components that like span the whole environment get a little bit of a relative boost, and those that uh, govern transitions that are local don't. Uh, but it's, it's basically just as simple as changing the coefficients. Um, so it, um, I guess, so, well, one, qualitatively, you want higher versus lower. Um, more quantitatively, you, um, there's a fall off that they do as a function of the, the levy walk, um, whereas um, the, the Gaussians have a different fall off, which govern diffusion. Um, I can show the equation later if you want. Um, but. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So in, um, in Euclidean space in particular, there's really no reason to, um, that you have to invoke this type of representation to do it. Um, the place where it really becomes useful is when you have environments where um, a Euclidean levy walk doesn't have a good definition. Um, so if you have a multi-compartment environment or you have a non-Euclidean environment and you want to generate the same sorts of exploratory behaviors, 
um, you would need to start using something like this or, or maybe some other method that captures something similar we haven't thought of. Um, I don't think there is evidence that this happens, but we want to start making um, hypotheses about it. So this is why we worked on it. <laughs>